Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and you're listening to The Business of Content, a podcast about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. This week, we're talking about the book publisher Macmillan and why it decided to enter the podcast space. If you run a hit podcast, you might have a couple avenues open to you for monetization. You could host live events and charge admissions, like what we've seen with Slate's political gabfest and Pod Save America. You could like Gimlet Media, launch a membership program and charge $60 a year for free t-shirts, exclusive bonus content, and access to a private Slack channel. Or you might turn to running sponsored ads within your podcast, an approach that generated $220 million for podcasts in 2017. But Macmillan's podcast network is more diversified than most. The book publisher has been producing podcasts since 2007. In addition to selling host read sponsorships, it's also generated revenue from running programmatic ads on its website. But what's perhaps most interesting is how it's leveraged podcasts to elevate the brands of its authors in order to sell more books and audiobooks. I recently sat down and interviewed Kathy Doyle, Vice President of Podcasting at Macmillan, about the publisher's strategy heading into 2018 as it expands its podcast lineup. Let's jump right into it. Hey, Kathy, thanks for joining us. Hi, Simon. Thanks so much for having me. So what is your official title at Macmillan? Uh, my title is Vice President Podcasting. Uh-huh. And what kind of led up to, I mean, what, what did you do before you were at Macmillan that kind of teed you up to for this kind of job? Oh, that's such a great question. Yeah, I spent a number of years uh, doing product and marketing development work for major publishing and media companies. I was with the Wall Street Journal for a very long time. In fact, I was on the original development team that launched WSJ.com back in the 90s, Mm -hmm. if I don't date myself too much by saying (laughs) that. Um, And then I moved around a little bit. I did a lot of consulting for WSJ.com, you know, through 2010, 2011. uh, And then I did a stint at the New York Law Journal, helping them to launch um, a digital competitor to LexisNexis. And during that time, I found myself interviewing with Mary Beth Roche, who's the president of Macmillan Audio. They were looking for someone to take over the Quick and Dirty Tips network. And that was back, you know, at a time when podcasts weren't really something everyone knew, you know, what they were. So I came into the, the role, which is really a combination of, you know, digital product marketing, product development, business development and then podcast oversight with great knowledge of two out of three of those. And, and I knew what a podcast was. So <laughs> uh-huh. I think that so, kind of- so, uh, your ba- so your background wasn't necessarily in, in podcast. It was in digital product building. That was, was the in strength digital that media. they were mm-hmm. Yeah, I was in digital media, you know, all types. I'd done, I did a brief stint right after college at uh, the NBC affiliate in Providence, Rhode Island. So I did have some production skills. Um, but yeah, I, I think all roads sort of led to this role. So you mentioned this quick and dirty tips network. And for a large part of Macmillan podcast history, that was kind of the main focus was this quick and dirty tips network. Um, when did you, we'll get into describing what it what it is, but when did you join Macmillan? Like it was after the, the network was already up and going, correct? Yes, the network was had been up and running for several years. I joined in two, early 2012. Uh-huh. So th- I think the network started as far back and as possibly like 2006, 2007. Um, when a uh, writer and podcaster named Mignon Fogarty started uh, a podcast t- called Grammar Girl, which was this huge uh, hit, was you know he, she was on Oprah, she wrote a New York Times bestseller, uh, a grammar book, and then she decided to um, basically she she launched her podcast, but then she she decided to expand it into an entire network of kind of different subject matter, but all kind of coming back to this uh, these quick and you know so to speak quick and dirty tips, this kind of evergreen content. Uh, that that wasn't t- news pegged and stuff like that. Uh, and then eventually she got a call from someone at Macmillan, right? And that's when she kind of uh, pitched the idea of this podcast network. That's correct. You know, John Sterling, an editor here, picked up the phone and called her in 2006. As you note, she had sort of this burgeoning network, which started out with her own show. And then kind of quickly, she ramped up to, to integrating uh, a few, several other subject matter experts. When John picked up the phone and called her, it sort of seemed like the conversation perhaps started with the idea of a book, but very quickly, both of them recognized the fact that this could truly be something much greater, uh, you know, for much greater significance for both Macmillan and for Mignon. And the joint mm-hmm. venture was formed in, in 2007. And I mean, I don't know how much John Sterling even knew what podcasts were back then. And that, and podcasting was a very nascent uh, medium back then. Uh, there wasn't like a lot of like big corporations really getting into them. What was kind of, what was he kind of thinking when he decided to, to take a bet on this? Like, wh- how did it fit within the strategic goals uh, of a traditional book publishing company? 
Great question. You know, he's, he's like many of the editors here, just very innovative in his thinking. And he did know of, of the podcast, had listened to the podcast. And at the time, and still, Macmillan, always wanting to be, you know, an innovator in the space, was very eager to participate and to take on more digital types of products and services. And I think, you know, our senior leadership just found that this was a wonderful opportunity for us to really bring out um, a new format and to expand our relationship with many authors at the time, just QDT authors. But now, as you know, we've expanded to a second network that includes authors from all genres and all imprints within our organization with the Macmillan Podcast Network. So Mignon mm-hmm. was, was the start of things. And we're still, she and I talk almost on a daily basis. We're still very tightly integrated and work with her very closely. And we now also have a team that's um, that I have oversight for, which is handling the second network. And what is the kind of strategic uh like integration between a book, like a traditional book publishing company and a podcasting network. Um, like it's not like just a normal podcasting network where it's singular focuses ads. Um, how does it integrate into the publishing arm itself? And I'm still, I'm still talking about the quick and dirty tips network for now. It's a great question. It can go either way. In the case of QDT, the first example that comes to mind is Dr. Ellen Hendrickson, who hosts our Savvy Psychologist show. It's one of uh, the top ranked and one of our most popular and largest shows. She came into us in about 2013 with just a cold email to our editor looking to do some blogging and some writing for us. We built that relationship. She is a true subject matter expert. She was at the time um, on the faculty at Stanford and has continued in her career trajectory um, to become a leading authority on the subject of social anxiety, among other things. But uh, we signed Ellen on for a book deal. And that book uh, called How to Be Yourself is launching in March of this year. Really excited about it. Already getting some great early reviews. Uh, She's now a regular contributor to Psychology Today, to Scientific American, and a number of other leading major publications. And it all started with QDT. So we're delighted to be able to take a subject matter expert or an author and really help them grow their platform in a meaningful way and then extend that relationship from the podcast possibly to a book or lots of other opportunities that we have here. Uh, And then, of course, it it also works the other way. Like we will take – I think we counted up last year on the QDT platform. We were able to bring on at least 40 – authors from within the various imprints of the Global Macmillan resources, to have them either as featured guests, to have them do an audio excerpt on one of our shows. Our editors here, Joe Muscolino is the current editor of QDT, and he's always on the lookout for opportunities where there's someone working with a Macmillan editor to bring on content that we think is really relevant and valuable to the QDT audience. So the so the podcast can be kind of like a, a vehicle for selling books, right? Like it, like it's you can build up the brands of the, of the of the authors, build up a really kind of loyal audience via the podcast, uh, and then that audience can be kind of like a you know a seeding audience for uh, selling basically books, right? Sure. Books, events, all kinds of things. You know, anything again that puts value in the hands of our of our listeners, uh, we're open to. So you have the you have the podcast, you have the the books, but you also have a website. Can you talk a little bit about that and and why it's such a uh, a great audience vehicle, especially from an SEO standpoint? Sure, I mean that does definitely help us with SEO. We have a a large scale digital network that's multi-platform. So every host submits his or her transcript for QDT shows in advance. They're vetted and fact-checked and, and um, you know, put back into the onto the server by our editor, Joe. And then they record and we take that transcript. And when we release the episode, our CMS has sort of a custom feature that simultaneously publishes that transcript to the website. So it gives us a great opportunity to kind of expand upon things that the host might reference. It gives us an opportunity to backlink to previous episodes and transcripts that might be related to content that's referenced in the current episode. Uh, And it gives us a nice opportunity too to link to extras like PDF supplements, like Grammar Girl might do an episode and we can offer our listeners or our readers the opportunity to access a free downloadable editor's checklist or whatever that resource might be. So we always, you know, we're always looking at content in, in multiple um, formats. Mm-hmm. And the reason I mentioned SEO is because the Quick and Dirty Tips Network, almost by defin- definition, because it's a self-help network, it's it's evergreen content. And it's the kind of evergreen content that people tend to 
uh, you know, questions they tend to type into Google. Like I can't tell you how many times I've ended up on a Grammar Girl article because as a writer, I'm always, you know, all these kind of like more arcane grammatical rules when I'm writing an article, um, I'm always Googling them. And more often than not, I'm landing on a Grammar Girl article. And, and the same could be for um, your like personal finance podcast, for uh, your parenting podcast. Uh, they're all kinds of open-ended questions that you know, millions of people have on any given year. Uh, so there are a lot of them are landing on your articles, maybe not knowing at first uh, that there's this quick and dirty tits p- network, but they're discovering it through just kind of uh, discovery through Google, right? That's exactly right. We do have a very high percentage of our traffic that comes in through SEO and through search. So that is something that we monitor very closely. Uh, we're working on a redesign for the site now, actually, which should launch sometime perhaps by early Q2, where we are working harder to do what seems very like a very natural extension to us, which is surface the podcast within the web pages. There's a player on every page, um, and we're just going to do a better job of, of surfacing that so that people who come to the site can say, oh, I can also listen to this content. So you guys are actually a pretty highly diversified media company because, um, like I said, like the, the most, most podcasts are, are just um, monetizing through advertising. But here you have the podcast monetizing through advertising. I think they're selling, you're selling through mid-roll, correct? That's correct. And then you can have programmatic ads, display ads on the website itself. Uh, and then you have the book sales. Um, it seems like you're, I don't know, maybe you're already doing this, but it seems like your are the quick and dirty tips like that niche uh, would really do well with e-commerce type affiliate advertising stuff too. Have you guys done anything with that? We do some, we have some affiliates, uh, but primarily we just drive to all the major booksellers. Well, I mean, I just in terms of like the self-help stuff, like I could see like a finance, uh, the finance uh, personal finance podcasts, like linking to some kind of software product or something like that. And you guys linking, using an affiliate link and making money off of that, or d- lots of different things that lend itself to making recommendations for buys that could, that could really leverage that type of stuff. Yeah, we definitely could be doing more of that. It's, it's not part of our core and that's mostly our focus, but we do, do, uh-huh. do, do a limited amount of affiliate links. Yeah. Uh-huh. So uh, the quick and dirty tips, that was the kind of main focus, but obviously Macmillan is much larger than just the quick and dirty tips network. And, and it also has um, subsidiaries like uh, Tor Books, which is like a science fiction fantasy publisher. So how did you guys expand beyond the quick and dirty tips network? So we quickly realized that not every author, not every content set was really appropriate for the Quick and Dirty Tips Network. And we introduced our first non-QDT podcast in 2016 with an author by the name of Kara Brookins. You might recall her story. She was pretty quickly emerged as a viral figure. She um, had sort of hit a bad point in her life where she was uh, looking for a place to live and she and her kids literally used YouTube to build their own home. Uh, That resulted in a a book that was published here, and we turned it into a podcast as well, where she interviewed people in sort of similar situations or others who had inspirational tales to tell. That was a success. And at that point, we went to senior leadership here and requested some additional resources to really build out a second network. And that officially happened over the summer. So we've now started Mm -hmm. to do uh, podcasts in a variety of genres. We had Steal the Stars, which was our first venture with Tor Labs and Gideon Media. Um, Gideon Media is in part owned by Mac Rogers of Life After and The Message fame. Uh, We are currently, we have about five shows that we've launched already and several more in development. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about Steal the Stars because I thought that was uh, really kind of innovative in terms of like how that was planned out, um, you know, as a podcast, an audio book and an actual physical print book. Can you talk a little bit more about like how that came about? Sure. So uh, Jen Gunnels and Marco Palmieri, who are the uh, co-founders of Tor Labs within our organization, uh, they had been approached by Gideon Media. They'd known these guys as playwrights, as screenwriters. um, uh, for a long time in the New York theater community. And they were approached. Uh, and Gideon Media is like a science fiction drama. Does, you know, they, they put on science fiction plays and stuff like that, All right? kinds of different things. You know, they do a lot of writing. They do a lot of production. They do a lot of theater. Uh, and they had um, come to us with uh, a few proposals for different um, audio drama podcasts. And the one that we worked with them on was, again, Steal the Stars. And it was really just a huge and really successful collaboration. The series surpassed a million downloads. It really continues to perform well postseason. And our strategy there included just sort of taking the podcast content and adapting it, as you noted, into a trade paperback and an ebook, 
And we just recently released the audiobook, which included some uh, great bonus content. We also did a couple of live events. We did a prequel live event that sold out. And it all continues. Everything we did post-season continues to drive a lot of interest in the podcast. So in this case, uh-huh. having this project be podcast first, we think was definitely a, a nice innovation for Macmillan and definitely something we'll be doing again. Mm-hmm. So it was a serialized science fiction story where each each episode was a different chapter in that serial. Um, and then I believe you guys got a, a well-respected, like the guy who did the message, which is a, right? Am I, am I remembering it's, this correctly? He's, it's Mac Rogers. He's the same writer. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he did this, uh, you know, this amazingly successful, um, basically radio play for GE, I think called the message had over 8 million downloads. So he was kind of famous within the podcast scene. So th- this entire thing and what, what I thought was so innovative about it was that it was kind of all pre-planned in advance. Like it was, uh, you know, someone was simultaneously writing and recording the the podcast, but also you guys commissioned someone to be writing a book that kind of basically followed the exact same plot so that you guys could really coordinate uh, the release of the podcast. And then uh, upon completion of that, once you've built up a fan base, then uh, launch the book after that and then convert the podcast cast into an audio book. Uh, so they all kind of dived in together in terms of that diversification of revenue and, and brand building and everything like that. Right. And at the same time, we monetized the podcast, uh, working um, with get the team at Gideon to do some, I thought they were the, the live read ads that that team did were some of the best I've ever heard. They were entertaining. They were informative. Uh, they were well produced. Um, I just, I feel like we really hit, hit on a great model with Steal the Stars and mm-hmm. we were very pleased with the outcome. And you said that it, it had over a million downloads? Yes. Uh-huh. And so did, did you kind of see, and I don't know how much you personally were kind of monitoring all this, but like, was there like a whole fan base that you felt like really kind of sprung up and became addicted to it and everything? Oh, without question. It was so rewarding for Tor, for Gideon, for all of us to see the social that was, you know, following the series as as it went through the 14 episodes. We, without question, had... had um, what our editor Alyssa Martino likes to call addictive storytelling. It was, it was, it really caught on. Yes. Mm-hmm. So serialized fiction podcasts are really becoming a thing now. Was that your first fiction podcast? It was. Uh huh. And so, what what kind of discussions did that spur within Macmillan? Because obviously, you guys publish like the the publishing company as a whole publishes a whole lot of fiction. What what were the discussions moving forward about whether you should be moving more into that realm? Oh, we have some work uh, proposals that we're considering right now. We're also launching a show with a uh, best selling author Will Schwalbe. He wrote the End of Your Life Book Club and happens to be an executive vice president here. This show really looks at books and reading and how books have changed people's lives. Um, we like to say the show is for intimate interview. The show is for fans of intimate interviews with Anna Sale or Terry Gross, who also love the New York Times book review. Uh, early guests are going to include Katie Couric and Sam Sanders. So that's launching this week. We're really excited about that. Mm-hmm. And then one uh, you know, arena that a lot of podcasts are moving into is selling their IP into other mediums. Like Gimlet has now sold several projects to both TV and movies. Uh, it just seems like every single week now we're learning about somebody like somebody in Hollywood uh, buying up to the rights to some kind of podcast. Uh, I'm sure Macmillan uh, has a long history of selling, you know, obviously um, it's a, well-worn tradition for uh, movies to, uh, to option uh, the film right or, you know, Hollywood to option the film rights for books. Has there been any discussion about um, how you can integrate uh, that more into the podcasting in terms of selling IP, like for something like, say, Steal the Stars? So, yeah, I mean, that's a conversation that's ongoing here at Macmillan and has been for many years. Uh, we have a division here for entertainment run by Brendan Deneen. Uh, those conversations are ongoing and certainly any opportunity would be examined carefully. Carefully, but to date, none of our podcasts have, have gotten to that point. You know, to date, I think we've been really looking more internally. What can we do to take this content and diversify it and disseminate it to listeners, to fans, to readers in all the different ways that we think are possible and valuable? But we're certainly open to that possibility. It would be great. Mm-hmm. And one of the quickest growing industries, sub industries within the book publishing industry is audiobooks. I forget what the percentage is, but they're they're seeing some of the you know highest uh, growth rates likely because because of the rise of Audible and smartphones, now that everybody has basically an audiobook player uh, in their pocket, um, what kind of like and, and what kind of conversations, uh, strategical integration are you having with Macmillan's like audiobook arm? Like, obviously, you guys created one for Still the Stars. It, it, in terms of the future, are there more? Are there any other kind of 
uh, talks going on about uh, how there could be more collaboration between the podcast side and the audiobook side? Well, we're all related. I report up to Mary Beth Roche, who's the president and publisher of Macmillan Audio. So those conversations are going on every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you think it could be possible that um, that you could take like an entire season of something from like the Quick and Dirty Tips Network and possibly turn it into an audiobook that you could sell? Or do you think that you'd rather just keep those for free now? We're doing a little bit of that. We're actually going to be testing some um, audiobooks that take about, I don't know, seven to 10 episodes of Quick and Dirty Tips shows and put them together into limited edition audiobooks for libraries. And we'll see how that goes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Kathy, those are all the questions I had. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, Simon. Great to talk to you. And uh, and where can people find you? Oh, quickanddirtytips.com. You can Google Macmillan Podcasts and follow us on all the social platforms. Please join us. And do you have a Twitter handle? Sure. You can follow Macmillan Podcasts on Twitter at at Mac underscore podcasts. And my Twitter is kpdoyle1. Okay, great. Well, it was fantastic talking to you. We'll have to have you on again in the future to talk more about what you guys are doing. I'd love that. Thanks, Simon. Okay, that's all I have for you today. Be sure to subscribe to the Business of Content on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. See you next week.